All right, good morning, everyone. So today we're talking about uh, radiosity and shadow. So we're moving to the more advanced techniques of graphics since we've finished up uh, the pipeline, the basic graphics pipeline last time. So the first in the first part, I want to talk about radiosity, which is related to shading, to lighting, to light calculation, because we already said last time that we are dealing so far, we have been dealing with directed light, so light that is comes from a direct light source. And one of the problems with this is, I already mentioned this last time, if we have a situation, for example, we have a light here with a light bulb that shoots out the light, then our current model that we have, if we, for example, have our eye vector in this direction, if we look at the point from this angle here, then of course it gets the light that is, whoops, that is uh, reflected from this light source here, from the light angle. But all the other points here, for example, on the ceiling, where we don't have a direct connection to the light, will be, if we model this in a straightforward way with our model, with our simplified shading model, will be completely dark. Although, of course, intuitively we all know that if we have a light, even if the light is in a way that uh, the room light, that it shines only down, that the ceiling of the room is, of course, not completely dark. And that is because light is also reflected. We do not only see the direct light, but we also see indirect light or there is also indirect light which in graphics is often called global illumination that is we have a global light a global illumination that is around in the room which is the result of course of all these reflecting lights so this and radiosity is one of the more advanced approaches to deal with global illumination uh, surprisingly it's not covered in the book not even in the advanced topics same goes for the second part for the shadows but i will provide additional links to further literature on the website but also for the exam you should be able to the material that i should give you in the lectures and in the in the tutorials should be enough to uh, uh, is sufficient for the exam and if you're more interested into uh, getting a deeper understanding of it then i will put some references on the website good all right so let's start with uh global illumination and like i said we have this straightforward problem that if we have a direct light we don't parts that are not directly hit by that oops not directly hit by that light will be completely dark but also direct light produces an image usually that is not really that realistic it looks like a little more artificial like you see here in this example on the left side you have the direct light which is calculated with uh, for example the uh, the simplified shading model on the right side you have an example for a global lighting which is considering this global illumination and you see it looks much more natural one of the things that you realize immediately is that here on the ceiling for example the right one has a reddish uh, appearance which is of course because of the reflection from the red uh, from the red floor, from the color of the red floor, and also you see, for example, here the shadows. Here you have a strict transition between a shadow and no shadow, whereas here you have a more smooth transition from the shaded er from the area with the shadow to the area that is directly into the light. And this is uh, in in graphics we call this a hard shadow, and this is a soft shadow. And this is what we want to talk about in, in, in the second part of the lecture today, about shadows. But now we're talking about the global lighting, the global illumination. And we already had this last time when we talked about this, when I said we have a little uh, a trick to do this, which is this ambient light. So this is basically just a copy-paste of what we had last time, where we said this is our simplified shading model, and then we just add a constant term to all the light, which is some kind of... Uh, a basic ground play, uh, color or light that we always have everywhere and then we just add this as a constant factor to our as a constant term to our shading or light calc our color calculation with the with the shading and then we have solved this problem that parts of the room are, all, are sometimes dark because they're not hit by a direct light 
of course, this, this works quite well in certain situations and can, for example, produce like the images that you have on the left side, uh, where you also see that, of course, the ceiling is not completely dark because we have added a certain ground uh, light to it. But um, it is a very simplified model. And you see here, it's, uh, there's a reason why I call it here a trick. Um, or last, uh, last time in the book, we were also talking about, uh, I, I said that in the book, they also write at some point that these are all hacks. Um, <clears throat> now, the, uh, uh, and, and another, another example we, we talked about last time is that you place a light source at the camera, a, di a very dim light at the camera, and that way you also get some sort of a global illumination uh, everywhere. But again, this is a simple trick, a simple hack. And uh, one of the problems is, of course, what I just uh, also told you, that uh, it doesn't uh, support the color bleeding, which is a, a technical term for the transfer of color between objects and the light that is reflected by them, which is exactly this uh, situation that you, for example, get a reddish uh, ceiling because you have a red floor. and. Uh, the other thing is uh, with this direct light, we always said uh, so far that it only depends on the direction of the light, but it doesn't depend on the distance, how close it is, which of course makes sense if you think about a lamp that is high up or for example, a sunlight, it doesn't make a difference how far away I'm from the sun unless I'm coming too close, of course. But uh, for, for the light calculations, that doesn't uh, make a difference. But if you have, for example, a bright object and you put it next to another object, then the, the light that is reflected from this bright object also influences, of course, the light that is on the object next to it. And this kind of uh, uh, influence of the distance is, of course, not modeled with this diffuse light like we had it so far. Good, so we're now uh, <coughs> talking about uh, radiosity, which is one of the, or probably the most uh, popular or most prominent approach to do this um, uh, so-called diffuse reflection, which is uh, then uh, considering all these, these, these influences. And uh, we do this by, by just starting with, with a simple example. So look, uh, let's look at this uh, example where we have a room. And in this room, you see we have three windows. And inside of the room, we have two pillars. And we want to see now how the light condition is at this one pillar to understand how this approach of radiosity works. So um, <clears throat> in, uh, in radiosity, we actually don't talk about light, but we talk about energy. And that is because uh, radiosity has its origins in the area of uh, thermal heat transfer, which is the emission and reflection of heat. And of course, light is a special sort of heat. Um, and uh, so you see this is a, a model that is more motivated by physics than what we had so far. So far we also considered physics, for example, we talked about the Lambert's cosine law, um, which specifies how light is reflected on a surface, but it was always a rather simplified version, whereas radiosity tries to do a much more advanced, a much more sophisticated modeling of the real situation, what is really happening in physics. And like I said, it has its roots in uh, the area of thermal heat transfer, so which uh, it is more based on the on the physics. But also, of course, that uh, that uh, means that it is uh, uses much more advanced mathematics, which is why I will only cover the basic idea here, because going into the deep mathematics of it will go beyond the, the focus of the course. Like I said, for those who are interested in more the mathematical background, I will provide some references. So, but with the basic idea that I tell you here, if you have a, a background in mathematics or a high interest in it, you should be able then to figure it out and uh, uh, be able also to implement it. Um, also in the exam, of course, I will only, uh, I will not ask you about the details of the mathematics, but only the basic ideas, or you should be able to answer some multiple choice question, but uh, not do some really uh, complex uh, multiplica uh, calculation that you would need here. Um, so you don't need to memorize all these mathematical formulas that I'm presenting you here today, but you should, for example, be able, if I show you one of these equations, to understand the intuitive idea behind it. And I will give you an example for this later. Good. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So what we do in, in, uh, in radiosity, we look at it uh, not in respect to light, but we 
uh, see light as a specific kind of uh, energy and then we talk about the energy transfer between parts in our room and these parts are so-called patches so the idea is to split our room or our scene or our object the objects in our scene in single patches like you see those tiles or, or squares that we have here and then for each of these tiles or each of these patches we look into how is the light situation at this particular patch, what kind of light comes in and what kind of light is reflected to make then this uh, global illumination. And um, <clears throat> so, so the idea of uh, radiosity, radiosity is then defined as the amount of energy that leaves a patch per unit per, per time unit per unit area. And the area is of course the area of the patch and uh, so informally we can say that the radiosity is a measure for the brightness how bright does a patch shine and the uh, important idea behind it is that we do not distinguish between an explicit light source and an object that is just reflecting but basically each patch is considered as its own light source and the light that it emits is the light that it per default emits if it is an active light source or the light that is reflected because of all the incoming light that reaches this patch. <clears throat> and this is then of course the, the idea of moving from light to the term energy because then we can summarize this as the direct light that is emitted but also the light that is reflected. So each patch is basically seen as an individual light source. Good. Now, if we look at this uh, single patch here on this image, if we look at the situation, if you remember how the room looked like, then from this patch, if it looks into the room, this is what the patch sees on the left side. If it is up on the tile, it doesn't see, it sees the windows, but it doesn't see the sun because the sun is too high up. Now, if we go a little lower on our pillar, then the next patch, at some patch, we reach a point where we start seeing a little bit of the sunlight in the top corner of the window. And the more we go down, the more patches, uh, the more the patch uh, we're looking at is at the bottom of the pile, the more sunlight we see unless we, uh, until we see the whole sun in, our, in the window. And that is, of course, then the patch that, uh, those are the patches that we uh, get the maximum income of light. So uh, if we then model this light on the patch. This is what we get on the pillar. We see at the top, we have a couple of, at the very top, we have the dark patches that don't see any light if they look into, uh, look towards the window. That's the situation on the left image here. And then we start getting some patches that see a little bit of the sun and that, that, that is, the, uh, they get a little bit of the light. And the more we move down, the more that then we come to a point where the patches see the whole sun. That is, they get the maximum amount of light. And that means that in this image, a black and white or gray shaded image, uh, we get a completely white uh, patch here. And uh, <clears throat> if we look at this then in the entire room, we see here, of course, that the bottom of the patches and the floor, these are the areas that get all this direct light from the sun. And we see here that this is exactly the situation I was talking about at the beginning to motivate why we're doing this in the first place, that you know, if you have a room and a window and there is a sun coming in, you know that the ceiling is not completely dark, uh, although there is no direct connection between the ceiling and light. But because of the reflection, of course, you see that this is not realistic, but realistic would be that you have also, you can also see the, the ceiling, but with, of course, a lower light than you see the floor that has the direct sunlight. So <clears throat> the situation with ready, and, and the reason for this is, of course, because the light is also reflected. So we have to consider this reflection. So if we look at what the, pay, uh, what the patches see now, if you think about a patch at the top here, then before that, that this patch didn't see any light at all. And now we have modeled this direct light and now the patch sees this light here at the bottom and here on the side. And that is of course the light that is reflected towards this patch, which contributes to his, in reality, to his overall color. So the patch becomes a little brighter because of this reflected light. So we can consider this light in the calculation of the color of this patch and that would make the patch a little lighter and it would also make all the other patches lighter. So you see here after considering this direct light and the reflection of it, the whole room becomes a little lighter. 
but if it becomes a little lighter it means the patch sees even more light and reaches gets even more light in the next round so if we do it again if we consider it again so this is then the uh, the second the third and the fourth round and you see the room gets lighter and lighter because all these reflections are keeping adding up until of course at a certain time uh, it starts to converge or it reaches a level where the changes are not uh, that much anymore that we can say okay this is a pretty stable situation now so for example this is the 16th iteration and then we can say okay this is a realistic image now and this is the image that we use yeah Yes. Um, it is expensive, but it will actually turn out that this is the uh, the least expensive way to do it. But we'll talk about this afterwards. Yeah. Good. So this is just uh, the basic idea of it, that we consider this uh, constant re uh, reflection of the light. And um, like you already said, this is an iterative pr uh, process. So the whole radiosity approach is not feasible in real time we do always do this in a pre-processing step but even then we have to optimize it because it takes very long good yeah so this is the basic idea so now we want to formalize this in a in a way that we can also of course implement it in our computers and for that of course we need to move from these informal definitions that i gave at the beginning to a more uh, mathematical specification of it and we say, <clears throat> and to do this we say that we describe a, a patch with the letter a i and the index i of course is an index over all the patches and then the radiosity of this patch is denoted with the letter b i and this radiosity like we said depends on the light that is emitted so if this patch is an active light source then of course there is some energy that is or some light that is emitted by this light source and uh, if it is not then of course this energy term is just zero so the uh, the radiosity is the sum of this light that is per default emitted plus of course the light that is reflected from this patch which is defined as the sum over all incoming radiosity times a so-called reflectivity factor which of course models what kind of or how much light or what fraction of the light is reflected. For example, um, uh, wood would reflect less than uh, a, a polished marble, for example. Uh, so the material plays a role, also the color plays a role. A red uh, surface reflects, different, reflects light differently than a blue surface. And this is where this, uh, this is modeled with this uh, reflectivity factor. And uh, then we sum over all the incoming light here. So we have here, uh, which one hits it? Okay, let's say this is like this. Then uh, this hits it here and this is get, getting reflected, of course. And this is all the bees that uh, hit them here, hit it here, are reflected. And then we have to sum up because they all add to this brightness, to this intensity or to this energy that is emitted from this patch AI. But now we see there is also another factor here which is uh, a dimensionless factor that we call the form factor and of course that factor models what we also have to consider which is the relation between these two patches because of course we see here uh, if we have a patch there is with, with no direct connection then of course the the like if there is a patch that emits in this direction and we don't even see it from here of course then this patch doesn't give us uh the 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 uh radiosity that's emitted by this patch doesn't contribute to the uh, radiosity that is reflected here so uh we have to consider this and this is uh done with this uh so-called form factors which are defined and this is for example uh, one of the formulas that I said that you do not need to remember in the exam but if I show you this formula you should be able to explain intuitively the idea of it and um <coughs> the uh uh, so the uh, and the, the intuitive interpretation of it is, of course, we have to think about if we have two patches and we want to talk, think about how is the light or the energy transferred between those two patches, how how does that energy or, or what kind of parameters 
influence the the amount of energy that is transferred between those patches. And first of all, of course, it seems obvious to say that the shape of the patch kind of influences how this energy is transferred. If we have a small patch or a large patch, of course, the amount of energy that is emitted from it changes. Also, like we said, the distance uh, that we haven't considered so far in the direct light situation. In this situation, it does make a difference. The distance, like I said, if you have a shiny object and place it next to another one, that influences how this other one is uh, uh, appears to you because we have this reflection of light between objects uh, considered now also. So the distance is another point. And of course, the orientation of the patches is also uh, something that is uh, considered. So if you have two patches like this, of course, the energy that is then the, the, the radiosity is transferred directly between them. Whereas if they are in a, in a more in an angle like this, then of course, the energy is not uh, hit directly. That is kind of related to what we had with this uh, light source where we also considered the angle in our simple shading model. So uh, <clears throat> this seems intuitive that these are the things that, that influence it. And we model this with this formula, which uh, again, I will not go into details because this goes beyond linear algebra because you need analysis with the integral here. Um, but uh, if you look at the formula, you see that how the intuitive relation between what I just said and the form factor, because you see here that, uh, for example, we divide by pi with r to the power of 2, and r is the distance between the patches. So we see if the distance gets larger, r is in, or we see r is in the denominator of this formula. So if the distance gets larger, that means this whole value, the form factor, gets smaller, which means, of course, the influence or the exchange of light between those two patches is smaller if they are further away from each other, which I think seems uh, is very intuitive. Another intuitive thing is, like I just said, if the angle between those, the orientation between the two gets larger, then, of course, also the, inf the, the exchange energy gets smaller, which means the form factor should get smaller. And we see here we have the cosine of these two angles here in the formula and the cosine is of course I uh, hope you remember it it is maximum for zero so if they are the angles are zero if they are basically uh, perfectly aligned we have a maximum exchange of energy and the larger the angle gets the smaller gets the cosine and that is the smaller gets the form factor and the smaller gets the influence of that particular patch here on the overall radiosity of this new, uh, of this other patch um, the only thing that is probably, unless you're uh, familiar with analysis, uh, not that obviously clear is this uh, shape of the patches, because here we are doing the, the integral, and an integral is usually used when you do uh, 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 an analysis over, over a surface. Um, but you probably see it a little bit better, the relation between the shapes here, if you look at the fact that these uh, form factors are symmetric. So if we calculate the form factor from AI to AI, uh, from I, AI to AJ, uh, we get the same result as if we calculate the form factor from AIJ to, from AJ to AI. Um, <clears throat> And that means we can rewrite also the radiosity in this way, which uh, I think uh, represents the relation between the shapes a little bit better. Good. There was a question here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is, uh, that is the surface, yeah. Good. Um, yeah. So uh, we know now how to calculate the form factors, and with the form factors, we know how to calculate the uh, the uh, radiosity. And the radiosity um, to calculate this, we can rewrite this in a way that we bring this to one side, and then we see if we look carefully that this is actually what we had before at the very beginning. This is a linear equation system. If you don't immediately see it, just write out the sum. And then you will see that, of course, there is also a bi in here. And that bi combined with that gives you this first factor here. And all the others are exactly, the other values in the matrix are exactly these, these, uh, these values that we have here. 
uh, for the B, uh, not BI. And uh, we see that here all the, the, the reflectivity factor, the form factors, and the energy, these are all the constant values. So only the BIs are the variables that we want to calculate. So we can write this in our vector here, like we know it from the linear equation systems. And then we can do, we can do the calculation which by solving this linear equation system. So to calculate this, uh, the energy or the radiosity, we just need to calculate the form factors and then we need to solve this linear equation system. The problem is, of course, this is not just a calculation. This is a very, uh, uh, very inefficient and very uh, expensive calculation because uh, also we have to think about that for each patch, you have to calculate the sum over all other patches which means in the end you have a quadratic number of patches that you have to calculate or a quadratic number of uh, calculations you have to do and I think you all know that a quadratic uh, runtime to the power of two is always a bad thing that you should avoid. So this is in practice too slow so we have to stick to a more uh, approximation approaches um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so, so let's look at the, at the form factors for uh, first, uh, like I said, uh, calculating them analytically is too expensive. Fortunately, there is an approximation of it, which, uh, or there is actually, an, it's not an, an approximation, this is uh, actually a perfect uh, um, alternative to calculate it, which is called the Nusselt analog, uh, or it's based on the Nusselt, uh, Nusselt analog. And uh, that says that we can also calculate a patch by, um, making a unit hemisphere around the patch, then projecting the light to the, the unit hemisphere and then projecting this part to the base unit base circle and then divide this by the area of the circle. Now that sounds very complicated, but it's actually quite simple if you look at it uh, with, uh, with an uh, illustration. So it says we have a patch and then we place a unit hemisphere around it. So in that case, in 2D, it's a unit circle. In 3D, it's a unit sphere. Um, <clears throat> and if we uh, then take this patch IJ, so this is our patch IJ, this is our patch AI, and then we project that onto our circle or our sphere, and then we project that here to the unit base circle, which is the circle here. And then we get a surface here. And then if we divide that by, uh, wait, I just want to make sure I'm not making a mistake here. Yeah, if we divide then, oh, it says here, if we divide then A by B, A is the first projection and B is the second one, then we get, no. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly the mistake I was hoping to avoid. Uh, A is then the surface here that we projected, that we calculated, and B is the surface of the unit circle. So if we then divide A by B, we get our form factor Fij, which like we saw earlier, is also the form factor Fji. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's the part I would not like to go into because that would require to explain all the the integral stuff. And that is, of course, also related to this, this previous question. So um, is it okay if I just refer to the literature or ask me the tutorial and we talk about it? Good. All right. Um, the... Uh, yeah, so this is a way how to calculate it quite easily, but unfortunately this is still very expensive, which is why we need well, we use usually in practice an approximation to it, which is just instead of calculating the projection onto the sphere, which is the expensive part, calculating uh, uh, with not a sphere, but with a box. And that way we can then project it, we can uh, take our so-called hemi-cube, which is a one cross one uh, cube around this, we can, uh, uh, around the patch, we can then divide it in smaller areas and then we sum up, we calculate the projection to, to this smaller area, then we sum them up and then we divide through, uh, and then we have actually the, the value for our patch and this is then the, the approximation of it. Good, and um, 
Yeah, and, and one of the things you also have to have to remember that this form factor is r quadratic, which is not only a problem in calculation time, but is also a problem with the storage, which is why they are often uh, computed on the fly when they are needed, but we're not stored anywhere, which means we really have to make this uh, relatively uh, efficient, even if we do it in a pre-processing step. Good. So uh, this is how we can calculate the form factors. Now we have to, you can use them to solve this linear equation system, but similarly to the calculation of form factors, solving this linear equation system is very expensive in practice, which is also why we use an, uh, a different approach, an approximation approach to do this. And this is basically exactly what I, what I told you at the very beginning when we, uh, when I, that I used as a motivating example. Um, that we do this iteratively. We first start by putting only the direct light, considering the direct light for each patch, and then each uh, the, we have new light sources, which are the, the new patches that have the light now, and then this light is of course considered in a second step. It's added to the original light, and then in the third step, we add, then we have even more light, which is added in the third step, and then in the fourth one, and so on, until we reach a third threshold or until we reach a situation where we say, okay, this is a realistic image now, so we stop here. And uh, so this is the iterative approach that I basically already explained at the beginning, but I thought it is easier for you to understand if I explain this iterative approach at the beginning instead of giving you the mathematical formulas and tell you, yeah, this is not uh, how it works because it's too expensive. So we go to the easier way. Good. Um, another uh, thing is, of course, um, I mean, I, I kind of quickly went over this part where I said uh, we are dividing our, our, our scene into single patches. But of course, the quality of our result heavily depends on how we do this division into patches, because you can imagine it, the larger those patches are, the less realistic our result is, or the smaller we make them, the more realistically we can model the light situation in the room. But of course, also, the smaller the patches are, the more patches we have, the less efficient our calculation is. So we have a trade-off between how fine granular we do, we make this patch uh, uh, subdivision um, <coughs> uh, compared to uh, how long it takes to calculate them, and which is why there are uh, also optimization methods for this, because uh, if you think about it, of course, if you have a situation where the light conditions don't change in a larger area, making a lot of small patches in that area is a waste of resources because the light situation doesn't change. So you could use just a huge single patch on that area. Whereas if you have a situation where the light changes a lot in a small area, then of course having a larger patch will re result in a less realistic image. So you want to have much smaller patches here, which is why sometimes you use uh, an adaptive sub subdivision and one of the approaches to do it, that is to, you do not have the same patch size for all the, the objects in your room, but you have a, a patch size that is adapted to the specific uh, light situation. And the, one of the ways to, to do this is to start with a very coarse subdivision. So let's look at an example here. So this example here where we have this area of the room, we start with a very coarse subdivision, like we have here two patches. And then, of course, if we just have the light condition differently for these two patches, obviously this creates a not, not a realistic image because we just have these two squares here. But uh, we see then, we then check neighboring patches. And then if we see there is a larger difference in the light situation between those two patches, so we check the neighboring patches. If there is a large uh, difference, then we say we do another division. So we come to this second case here, where we divide them further. And then again, we check neighboring patches. So this is not really probably not really a good, good example, because here there is still a difference in light. But nevertheless, the difference in light between these two patches is probably not as much as the difference in light that we have here. So we do more subdivisions in the area where there is a large difference. And then we do another check and then we see, of course, for example, here that uh, the difference here in light is still very high. So we make another subdivision also probably here. It's still very high. So probably here we make another subdivision. But here, of course, 
at the top we see there is not much of a difference here in light so we make no further subdivision here so you see here by going through this iteratively we can create a much finer subdivision at areas where it is really needed now that i'm looking at it, i think the the example is a little screwed up because uh i mean here the difference is still high so that should also be like this so uh yeah look at this example very critical i don't think it is correct but i hope it is enough to give you an idea of uh, to explain you the basic idea of it good all right and this is how we can calculate uh, the radiosity of course there are many other ways to, to optimize it and uh, <clears throat> that is one of the most uh, common ways to do modeling of global illumination and when we have that then we can use that um, to put global light on our room and of course we can also do the the traditional shading that we had so far like the only the diffuse shading and the funk shading and we can use then this global lighting for example to replace the ambient light that we have and combine it with our existing uh, model it is also very often used in ray tracing which we will talk about next time and um, Another important thing of this, because it is so uh, uh, um, um, expensive to calculate, it is usually done in a pre-processing step, but the advantage of this is if we don't have moving light sources, if the light, the global light situation stays the same, then we can calculate this before and we can walk, for example, through the room, we can create an animation through the room in real time because the, the global light situation doesn't change. So it is expensive, but we can do it in a pre-processing step, which is, uh, of course, a big advantage, for example, compared to ray tracing, which per default considers global lighting, but where the global lighting, cons uh, the, the light situation always depends on the viewpoint, so we cannot do it in a pre-processing step. But we'll talk about this uh, next time. Good. Any questions? If not, then uh, this is the end of the first part and uh, we make again an uh, earlier break. So let's meet again in about 15 minutes. <laughs>